with widespread protests, riots, violence, and lawlessness. Are we in the beginning of sorrows that Jesus referred to in his end time briefing to his disciples? Or will there be a third great spiritual awakening in the midst of the chaos as believers repent, seek God, pray, and intercede? Well, it's been said that if you look at the state of the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. But if you look at God, you'll be at rest. The New Testament mentions three end time mysteries that we want to explore today. The Jerusalem Channel is made possible by viewer support. Thanks for watching. Shalom, I'm Christine Dark. I've had the experience of giving birth twice. And once the contractions start, nothing can stop the birth process. The nearer to the time of the birth, the more intense the contractions became. And we're experiencing what Jesus referred to as the beginning of sorrows, the birth pains of the end times. Recently, I read a poll with a headline, Americans are the unhappiest they've been in 50 years. Well, this has been a very rough year for the American psyche. Many people are unhappy, agitated, and quite frankly, miserable. The poll comes from the COVID response tracking study at the University of Chicago. The study claims just 14% of American adults claim to be happy. There's just no peace when society trades the knowledge of God and faith for the false promises of secularism. Recently, I was touched by a prayer for Hong Kong because Hong Kong is being shaken by tough laws and protests. A pastor posted a prayer that I think most of us can identify with, crying, Heavenly Father, where are you? When we look out at our city, we're heartbroken. When we see young people in such a state of anger, that they will do violence and destruction, we cry, Father, where are you? When we see police lashing out in anger, we cry again, Abba, Father, where are you? But then, as we look behind the curtain into the spiritual realm, we see you, Lord, seated on the throne with myriads and myriads of angels falling before you in worship, declaring that you alone are worthy of praise. You alone are the one who holds history in your hands. Kingdoms come and kingdoms go. Political regimes come and political leaders go. But you, Lord, are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You're never shaken. But we're still in pain. Some of us are angry, fearful. Some are numb and indifferent. Others are hurt, feeling powerlessness. Come to your people at this time. Lord of love, heal our hearts. King of kings, calm our fears. And in our homes where such division has erupted, we cry for your shalom to reign. Amen and amen. And in the meantime, in light of current events today, I want to discuss three mysteries presented in the New Testament as three signs that will precede the second coming of Jesus. First of all, it's important to define what the word mystery, as used in the New Testament, does not mean. The Greek word mysterion, mystery, does not mean a whodunit detective story. The New Testament word mystery means an unveiling of one of God's secrets. It means a truth that was once hidden but has now been revealed in the gospel. Therefore, a Bible mystery is not something that's unknowable, but it can only be known through revelation as God reveals it. And one of these New Testament mysteries is referenced in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, called the mystery of lawlessness. And we're certainly seeing plenty of lawlessness right now. 
And another mystery to precede the second coming is found in Romans 11.25, which the Apostle Paul called the mystery of Israel's partial hardening until the fullness of the Gentiles has come into the church. I'm going to attempt to explain first this mystery of Israel's hardening. The Apostle Paul had ethnic Jews in mind when he stated that a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles are saved. But he said, eventually and inevitably, all Israel will be saved. Now, the fact that the apostle mentions Gentiles as a different group in the same verse confirms the view that Paul is referring specifically to ethnic Israel. He saw clearly that widespread Jewish rejection of the gospel would not last forever. He wrote that a partial hardening had come upon the Jewish people's hearts concerning Jesus, but that this rejection of Jesus would only be partial. Not every Jewish person would reject Jesus, as attested to by individuals such as the Apostle Paul himself, who was, after all, a rabbi in a Hebrew of Hebrews, as well as, of course, the Apostles Peter, James, John, and countless other Jewish Christians throughout history. Let's look at this word hardening that Paul used in Romans 11.25. The Greek word is porosis, meaning a covering with a callus, and used figuratively to describe blindness, hardness of heart, stupor, suspended animation. Yet this hardening will continue only, he said, until the fullness of the Gentiles has been redeemed. In other words, at some point in the future, the full number of redeemed Gentiles from all the nations will reach God's predetermined maximum. And of course, only God himself knows that number. Because we're supposed to interpret scripture with scripture, we do know that Isaiah 53, 11 prophesies that the Savior will be satisfied with the suffering of his soul for having made atonement on the cross for Israel and for mankind. So when the full number are redeemed, then and only then will Israel's hardening towards Jesus be lifted. This is not to say that ethnic Israel will become Christians as we know Christianity. It means that they as a Jewish nation will acknowledge Jesus, Yeshua is his Hebrew name, as their genuine Messiah. They will still be Sabbath keepers and guardians of the Torah a separate nation, in fact, the chief of nations. Paul was correct to call their future reversal of enmity against Jesus a mystery in Romans 11.25. In fact, the Hebrew prophets had predicted the incorporation and grafting in of former Gentiles into the Israel of God. But how this was to be accomplished was not clearly made known until the times of the New Covenant. Let's consider for a moment the rejection of the Jewish leadership of Jesus as Messiah. John 12, 37 says that during the week of the Lord's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, prior to Passover, although Jesus had performed so many miraculous signs before them, they still refused to believe in him. So when he presented himself as the Messiah to the nation, the national leadership rejected him. But did their decision take God by surprise? Absolutely not. The mystery revealed is that God always knew what the plan would be when Jesus was rejected by Israel. The plan was to extend mercy to the Gentiles during a mysterious period called the church. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For again, Isaiah prophesied, God has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they cannot see with their eyes and understand with their hearts and turn to him and be healed. Jesus himself lamented in Luke 19.42, If you had known, even you, especially in your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. 
The Gospels tell us that many of the Jews of his day did believe in him, but they didn't confess him for fear of being put out of the synagogue. The bottom line of this mystery is that we should never, ever presume that Gentiles have somehow replaced the Jews in God's eyes. The church is not Israel's replacement. I wish more churchmen understood this mystery concerning Israel's temporary hardening because replacement theology has been so very destructive and counterproductive throughout the history of the church. Jesus further prophesied in Luke 21, 24, that when Jerusalem is no longer under the domination of the Gentile nations, when Jerusalem is once again in the hands and control of the Jewish people, as they are now, the times of the Gentiles will be finished. The full number of saved Gentiles is therefore wrapping up now. And so it's happening in our generation right before our eyes as Jerusalem is once again the capital of the nation of Israel. This means Jesus will be coming soon for his completed bride, the church, and the time of Israel's hardening by God will be finished and lifted. God will, as it were, take his finger off of the pause button. That's the mystery of the hardening and unhardening of the nation of Israel. How truly and utterly wondrous and amazing are the days that we're privileged to see. Now, let's look at a second mystery referenced by the Apostle Paul concerning the last days, the mystery of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The word lawlessness in the New Testament literally means without law, without the Torah. It certainly cannot be denied that a spirit of lawlessness has been unleashed in America and Britain. Some are calling the waves of lawlessness the West's so-called Arab Spring. God has ordained human authorities to preserve law and order, as stated in Romans 13.4. But at the very end of the age, law and order will break down. People who refuse the love of the truth, who mock God, who shake their fist at God, who refuse to obey or respect God's word, will fall under a powerful delusion of derangement and irrationality. We shouldn't be shocked because the word of God tells us that we're not wrestling in this lifetime against mere human beings, but we're contending on a daily basis with principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Jesus prophesied about our times in Matthew 24, 12. He said, because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. Think about it. Throughout the history of famines, pestilences, and revolutions, selfishness and self-preservation intensify and cause people's love to grow cold. Long ago, Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that before the end comes, a falling away will occur, and then there will appear an evil ruler called the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, who will seize authority, both religious and secular authority, demanding total submission to his rule. He will be Satan's masterpiece, empowered to deceive people and turn them away from the truth. And this, Paul wrote, is the secret power of lawlessness. The revealing, the unveiling of the man of lawlessness will be the final manifestation of the mystery of lawlessness that's been operative throughout the church age, but until now has been held in check by the power of the church. Believers mustn't be discouraged when we see growing lawlessness, rioting, fraud and deception, skepticism and unbelief rampant all around us. These things were predicted. We were forewarned in scripture and we're encouraged to look up. All of this means our redemption is drawing near. Jesus's return and intervention in history will be very soon. God's restraining order has not yet been removed. Lawlessness is currently being held in check. Something is restraining the appearance of the man of lawlessness. And Paul indicates that the restraining power against total lawlessness is embodied in a person, the Holy Spirit. Paul said when the restraining one is removed, then the lawless one will be revealed. 
But there's a third mystery, a third secret revealed in the New Testament that will happen prior to the second coming. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. Not all of us will die, but all of us will be changed in a flash. In the twinkling of an eye, he said, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we, those who are alive, will be changed as we're caught up together to meet the Lord in the clouds. Well, scholars are careful to point out that the physical removal of the true church in the event known as the rapture does not mean that the ministry of the Holy Spirit will be removed from the earth. You see, according to Revelation chapter 7 and 14, the ministry of the Holy Spirit will continue through 144,000 evangelists representing the tribes of Israel and also through God's two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11. So this is an extremely important time to check our moral compass. If you find yourself consistently siding with anarchists and angry mobs, Marxists and virtue signalists, then you're deluded into following a fake Jesus of a false liberation theology, not the real Jesus who actually honored law and order. Jesus, Yeshua is his Hebrew name, was a law-abiding, Torah-observant rabbi who spent his entire life teaching how to live the moral law. And when King Messiah returns to rule the world from Jerusalem, then, as Isaiah 2, 3 declares, the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. In the interim, lawlessness has been kept in check by the spirit of the living God and also by the restraining power of our Judeo-Christian ethic. But take away the Ten Commandments, take away righteousness and morality, and we're seeing how fast people descend into chaos, lawlessness, and anarchy. Thank God up to this time, good forces have been restraining evil. But when God's restraining order is lifted, watch out. The Apostle Paul prophesied that the future final Antichrist will have the audacity to even sit in God's special space in the temple of God that's going to be rebuilt and dare to demand worship of himself. So here's the sequence outlined by Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. First comes the apostasy. Earlier versions of the Bible use the word departing rather than apostasy. First, the departure happens. As some theologians have explained that the departure could refer to the rapture. Then the restrainer is removed. And only when the restrainer is removed can the Antichrist be revealed. Paul clearly expected believers to be snatched out of this world in a pre-tribulation secret rapture before the day of the Lord. I use the word secret because remember, secret is a synonym for the New Testament word mystery. God is controlling the timing of the rapture and consequently the timing of the Antichrist's revelation. Something has to be removed before the world can be introduced to the Antichrist. And I believe the restrainer is the Holy Spirit within the genuine believers who will be removed, snatched. Then when the Antichrist is revealed, he will first masquerade as a man of peace, but he will reveal his true colors when he blasphemes God. He'll be energized and indwelt by Satan to unite the world in submission to him. It's easier now to envision how a dictator will gain control as we've watched the world acquiesce and relinquish personal freedoms for fear of a virus. In the United States, state governors and city mayors have been lording themselves over the people, requiring social distancing, prohibiting personal assemblies, and so forth. Yet a judge rebuked the mayor of New York City and New York's governor for giving preferential treatment to protesters while restricting religious gatherings. So we've seen demonstrated how a public health crisis can be used to control people. The Antichrist will demand total submission and allegiance. The effrontery of the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, will be the apostasy of all apostasies. In Matthew 24, 15, Jesus called it the abomination of desolation 
And Jesus was quoting Daniel 9, 27. The troubles that have always afflicted Israel will reach a climax in a short, sharp crisis known as the Great Tribulation leading up to the day of the Lord. Well, after assuring believers that they were not yet in the day of the Lord, in 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul instructed them and us to stand firm and to cling to our blessed hope of the sudden appearing of our Lord Jesus. I also believe the practical instructions in James chapter 5 suit the times that we're passing through. I'm going to start with verse 13 where James asks, is any among you suffering? So let me ask, are you suffering today? So many believers are upset at what's happening in our nations. Then James said, you must pray. Prayer is our 24-7 connection to God Almighty. Prayer makes a way where there just seems to be no way. And God specializes in the impossible. Holocaust heroine Corey Ten Boone lived a dangerous life by hiding Jews during World War II. And she said a wonderful thing about prayer, and I wholeheartedly agree that when we pray, we leave a world of not being able to do anything and enter God's realm where everything is possible. Amen. Next, James asked, is anyone cheerful? Well, then sing praises. Or is anyone among you sick? And if you're sick today, James advises that you should call for the elders of the church to pray, be anointed with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer offered in faith will restore the sick one, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed any sins, they will be forgiven. But because of the virus, you may not be able to call for an elder to anoint you with oil and pray the prayer of faith. Your church may be locked. Did you know that the New Testament also provides for evangelistic anointing with oil? In Mark 6, 13, it's recorded that Jesus sent out his disciples and they healed the sick, anointing them with oil. And why oil? It's a tangible representation of the presence of the Holy Spirit. As a point of contact, even if you're alone and isolated, you can consecrate some olive oil in the name of Jesus and anoint yourself or ask a believing friend or a family relative to anoint you. By faith, if you are sick or in pain, I come in agreement with you in the name of Jesus for relief and restoration. And I pray for your healing right now. Amen. Then let's look at this great verse, James 5, 16. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. You see, even the great prophet Elijah was a mere human being with a nature like ours. And yet it says here, Elijah prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't rain on the earth for three and a half years. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain. So like Elijah, just like you and me, we have to put forth the effort to pray to get answers from God. He prayed energetically and got definite answers. The word fervent here in James 5.16 literally means energetic. And weak people have to go to strong, energetic believers to pray for them and to pour oil on their wounds. Lord, help us to pray the effective, energetic prayer of a righteous person to accomplish much, as this verse says. But this is so important. How do we qualify as being a righteous person? Well, we qualify by receiving the Lord's perfect righteousness imparted to us by faith. We certainly should never trust in the delusion of our own merits. One of the majestic names of God is the Lord, our righteousness. Messiah Jesus, Yeshua, is our righteousness because our own self-righteousness amounts to filthy rags in God's sight. We're all sinners in urgent need of perfect righteousness that only the Savior can impart to us as a free gift. So ask Him to give you His righteousness for your unrighteousness, that's the meaning of the cross. Jerusalem's cross was the divine exchange where the sinless Savior took our sins upon his own body to pay our sin debt. Oh, what a glorious Savior. The believer is therefore obligated to maintain the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. Our instructions from the book of James 
were written to believers who were also going through stress, hostility, persecution, temptations, and trials. But they were exhorted to endure without doubting and always to draw upon divine resources, such as the prayer of faith. Is anyone out there suffering? Our instructions are pray, not worry, not moan, not despair and complain. Prayer is always the answer. The apostle said in Acts 6, 4, we must give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. I've always understood the need for the ministry of the word, but more than ever, I understand the need for the ministry of prayer. So I'm encouraging you today to be a watchman on the walls. The Lord testifies of himself. Behold, I am coming quickly. Believers who accuse other believers of just twiddling their thumbs while waiting for the sudden appearing of the Lord are sadly mistaken. The imminent possibility of the rapture encourages both scrutiny regarding our present moral condition as well as continued diligent work in this world. Knowing that the Lord could suddenly appear is a powerful motivation to purify ourselves and to lead a life worthy of God with sober, holy living. If you know that a very special and prominent guest is coming sometime soon to your home, but you don't know exactly when, you will be sure that your home is tidy and everything is in order. And that's what the doctrine of the any moment appearance of Jesus does to the behavior of a believer. It keeps us prayed up and ready. Furthermore, instead of just sitting and waiting, we're exhorted in 1 Thessalonians 5 to warn those who are being idle, to encourage the timid and help the weak, and to be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. The good news is that presently the times of the Gentiles are still open and there's room for you to humble yourself at the foot of the cross to receive eternal life from the Savior. Invite the risen Lord to guide you through these troublesome times. Then the joy of the Lord will be your strength and you won't have to worry about gloom and doom and fear-mongering words going around on the internet. Well, as I close today, I want to draw your attention to our website, exploits.tv, which reports on current events relating to the church and the nation of Israel. And at our website, also at our Jerusalem Channel YouTube site, there's a library of videos available 24-7, and we invite you also to sign up for our free electronic magazine, Exploits. Daniel 11.32 declares that the people who know their God will be strong, not weak, and we'll carry out exploits, meaning that we're going to accomplish the works of the Lord in the remaining time before the Lord's imminent return. If you have any questions about our ministry, you can stay in touch on your phones or tablets through our free Jerusalem Channel mobile app or contact me on the social media. Well, until next time, always contending for the faith and praying earnestly for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm Christine Dark. Shalom and Maranatha.